Hello, and welcome to the first of two recorded modules brought to you by the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare at the University of Minnesota School of Social Work. The first module is Supporting Addiction Recovery During COVID-19, What Child Welfare Workers Need to Know, Part 1, and the second module is Part 2. Just an introduction to me, your, your presenter, and the person who compiled these slides for you. My name is Amy Krentzman. I'm an associate professor of social work at the University of Minnesota, and I study addiction recovery. And therefore, I do research on spirituality, gratitude, forgiveness, 12-step programs, sober living houses, and the experience of recovery in rural communities. I teach the addiction course, and I do some child welfare modules, maybe some that you've already seen, and that's me on the left. First of all, I don't want to forget to say thank you to all of you child welfare workers out there for all you do. I know your job is hard. I know the difference you make in the lives of families out there um, in Minnesota and across the country, and I just really appreciate the, the work you do, how difficult it is but how important it is. Thank you. In, this, uh, in these two modules, we're going to cover all kinds of information, a wide range of information related to the current situation we're in under COVID-19 and how to support addiction recovery at this very strange time. I'm going to give you a ton of resources and I'm going to tell you about the research that backs up some of the suggestions I'm going to be making and I'll leave you with some recommendations. And that agenda will cover the first two modules. First of all, I want to let you know that these slides I'm sending you now, these slides we're, we're going to be going through together, are going to be available to you in a Google slide deck. And you can use these slides in any way that is useful to your work. If you want to use some of them, if you want to modify them, you're going to have access to the slides and you're going to be able to modify them and they are going to be saved for you um, in the link below these slides. I want to also bring your attention to a website we've created at the University of Minnesota School of Social Work. The URL is up there at the top of the slide and also right now these days the link to that URL is at the bottom of our main School of Social Work webpage down at the bottom. This is the website that I'm going to use to walk us through this, these couple of modules, and I'm going to give you an orientation to the website, but the website itself is a very useful tool in enumerating all of the resources out there with links to the actual resources. In the first module, here's what we're going to cover. Why this topic is important now. An introduction to the website in detail. What we already know about virtual meetings from research and other things we know. Uh, some information about research on Alcoholics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous attendance versus Alcoholics Anonymous involvement. I'll be defining those terms in this first module. In the second module, we are going to cover the following topics. We're going to delve deeper into the research on Alcoholics Anonymous and how it works. Not whether it works, but how it works. We're going to talk about this idea of the magic of the resource of abstinence-specific social support to addiction recovery. I'm going to tell you about some more 12-step resources that are available virtually, alternative mutual aid groups, Resources for those who are worried about someone else's drinking or drug use. Research on Al-Anon, 12-step conferences, which are now going on via Zoom, even during COVID-19. The role of doing service and helping others to support recovery. The amazing resource that is recovery community organizations. What to do if your client has a phone but no internet. So I've got a host of resources for that situation accessing addiction treatment at this time, and overall recommendations for you to help your clients to get and stay sober during COVID. 
So let's get started. Why do we need this module now? Well, we've been inundated with news media about the effect of COVID on addiction. One kind of story we're seeing are stories related to how the COVID crisis could trigger addiction relapse among those who are already sober. Now, why would COVID trigger addiction relapse? One thing is that a strong predictor of relapse is negative emotion, and we're all under a lot of stress now. Now, just because something is a strong predictor of relapse doesn't mean that relapse is inevitable. Another trigger for relapse might be for people in recovery. If they're sheltering at home in a stay-at-home order and the people in their home environment are using drugs and alcohol and our client can't get away from that scene the way they normally could, and that's going to put them right in the line of a high-risk situation for relapse. Number three, and maybe most pertinent to this discussion, is that with COVID, as you already know, AA meetings, face-to-face -face support group meetings for addiction recovery have closed, and everything's gone online. And that poses a certain kind of threat to recovery that we'll be talking about. But these online resources are absolutely astonishing. I hope in these two modules I will be showing you something that'll blow your mind, because when I was accumulating these resources, I was uh, like jaw hanging down, like in awe of all that's out there. There's much to feel optimistic about. The other type of news story we are sort of inundated with is how the alcohol sales rates have increased and how people's drinking behavior has increased during COVID. Now, what this can do is telescope someone's precipitation into an alcohol use disorder because people are home, maybe they're out of work, or they the certain kinds of social controls that would keep a lid on their drinking or keep their drinking under a certain threshold are absent. And so people are drinking more and that's gonna to lead to alcohol use disorder for, for many. So this is what our website looks like. This is the title banner and I'm gonna be um, showing you screenshots of the website as we move along and then there at the top I'll have the URL on many of the slides so you can go ahead and if you even want to, you can access the website live while you're watching this module. What do we know about virtual meetings? Virtual meetings, and by that I mean meetings that are not face-to-face, -face, meetings that happen through, through the web, or even through a written letter, which is how the earliest virtual meetings used to take place. Electronic virtual meetings existed before COVID-19. The earliest recovery bulletin boards were in the 1980s, and the first email groups were simply groups of AA members emailing one another, and that came forward in the 1990s. There's, apps, there's actually an intergroup for virtual meetings. That's its URL. You'll see its old homepage on the left, and just weeks into COVID-19, a new updated website um, on the right-hand side. So right as COVID descended, the AA community, the recovery community, pivoted very swiftly and nimbly to offer a ton of online resources. And one of the things is this update to the virtual intergroup website. Now, let me tell you what I mean by intergroup. Intergroup is traditionally meant an administrative office that exists that organizes all the local AA meetings. So this is the administrative office, if you will, located on a website that organizes all of the virtual AA meetings. Now, there's a couple of definitions of virtual meetings that I feel will be very useful to you. I found this on a blog that I thought was super brilliant way to think about it. Think of this idea of location agnostic virtual meetings. Now, the word agnostic, they don't mean that in the religious sense of the word. They mean that in the sense of the word of it being non-committal. And a location agnostic virtual meeting is one where it doesn't matter what city, town, or country the meeting is coming from. All that really matters is what time is it offered and what day is it offered. And these existed before COVID. Um, there was less concern with the geographic origin of the meeting and more concern with the daytime and the language. You want a meeting in a language you can understand. 
These are for participants from all over the world. And this blogger talked about how after COVID, these meetings went from about 10 to 20 people showing up to 400 people showing up. So that's a location agnostic meeting. It existed before COVID, it'll exist after COVID. And the fact that it's not nearby is irrelevant. A lo on, on the other hand, a location centric virtual meeting is relatively new. These are new virtual meetings that evolved in response to COVID. These are the normal face-to-face -face meetings that your people were already going to in the nearby vicinity, but these meetings were closed because of the COVID threat and converted, that exact meeting would be converted to an online format. And in this case, it's the same day and time as that normal meeting. And when your client goes to that meeting on Zoom, they're gonna see the faces of the familiar people that they're used to from their face-to-face -face meeting. Now, there's this idea that these meetings, these virtual meetings, will probably close down after COVID is over when people start to resume to meet face-to-face -face again. But at this point in time, I'm, recovering, I'm, I'm recording this module on May 8th, 2020. And at this point in time, it's really seeming like it'll be a long time before there are face-to-face -face AA meetings again, or NA meetings, in my opinion. So there's many types of virtual meetings. There's an online meeting, which is held via an internet connection, a phone line meeting held via a landline or a mobile phone. Some meetings are accessible either by phone or the internet. There are closed meetings only for those who identify as individuals with addictions or people who are looking to get support for their own drinking or drug use. And then there are, in fact, virtual open meetings where all are welcome to attend, but sharing is restricted to those who have a problem or are recovering from a problem with drugs or alcohol. So I took a one of these um, lists of international and national U.S. online meetings, a very, very large list of meetings out of 998 online meetings, and I analyzed them to see what kind of meetings are they offering? So the largest group is the red wedge of the pie. These are meetings that are video or phone meetings. Um, the next is video only meetings, the green wedge. There's the yellow wedge, which are phone, telephone only meetings, and a tiny sliver of what they called audio via web type meetings. So most meetings are accessible by phone or video. I took the same data set of online meetings, both US and international, and I looked at what kind of video conferencing provider was hosting the meeting, and by and large, these were AA meetings, Zoom for 96% of the meetings was the way people were going, with a minority being hosted on Skype. There has been just a little tiny bit of research on online meetings so far, and this um, infographic is the results of one of the very first studies. I'll just tell you a little bit about what they found. What they found is that people who attended online meetings, now this was before COVID, everything has changed now after COVID, but before COVID, people were participating in online meetings and they were surveyed, 123 people were surveyed who attended 12-step meetings online and they endorsed that they felt the online meeting enhanced their motivation for abstinence. I'm reading from the right-hand side of the slide. It increased their confidence to stay abstinent. It decreased their cravings to use drugs and alcohol, and it helped them feel better about being a person in recovery. So a survey of over 100 people who use online meetings basically said, I, found this, I find these meetings helpful to my recovery. Now this is a screenshot of the website itself. And one of the top headers in our website is how to attend AA meetings remotely. And the blue arrow points to one of the links of resources, New York City's list of remote meetings. Now, in my point of view, from the research I've done online, New York City has really stepped up and been a leader in the world of offering online meetings for AA members on Zoom. So they stepped up and their list of meetings includes meetings all over the world, even though it's hosted from New York. So let's go and see an example of what you'd find if you searched a link 
that link that the blue arrow is pointing to. So this is New York Intergroup Online Meetings, their online meeting list. And I noticed recently when I checked, there were 264 different meetings listed for a given Friday. There were 24 meetings listed between 12.15 and 1 p.m. on a Friday. Now this is relevant because one of the things we're going to be talking about later in the module is that one thing you absolutely have to prepare your client for if they're going to try online meetings for the first time, you're going to prepare them for a mild set of minor obstacles. These are minor frustrations, but if you let them know in advance, they won't be discouraged by them. One thing they're going to face is they're going to try one of these online meetings and they might not get to access it for a whole range of reasons. Maybe the time change didn't go through and they don't have the right hour of the meeting. Or maybe there's a password and they can't get the password. But look, there's 24 meetings at noon on Friday. What you're going to tell your client to do is go down the list and try one meeting after another and your client definitely will get into a meeting. But not to be discouraged if there's just some nu nuisance things that happen in the beginning. So back to our AA uh, remote meetings list and let's look at another superb list of AA meetings that are online. This is a list of US and international AA meetings from the virtual AA intergroup site. So what this shows, shows the day of the meeting, the time, now the time is in Pacific time, so if you're in Minnesota like I am, we have got to, I always have to stop and think about it, we have to add two hours, so a little math is involved. We've got to add two hours to this time, which is another thing you want to coach your clients on, to adjust the time change given the source of the meeting. This shows the meeting name, whether it's phone or audio, uh, the phone number to use, the link, the type of meeting, whether they would sign a meeting slip electronically, and a good number of them do, and any other specific instructions. And one last thing to say about AA meetings remotely, and that is that there are now several, I counted seven last time I counted, online meetings on Zoom that are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So these are Zoom links where any time at all, day or night, your client can click and get into an AA meeting. And I noticed in my research that I saw two Narcotics Anonymous meetings that were running 24-7. Now let's take a step back and talk, to, talk about obstacles to remote meetings. And I've got a picture of the oldest microwave I could find because I want to tell you a story that I believe is relevant to the current moment. So I don't know how old you are, but my age is one where I remember when we got our first microwave. And when we got our first microwave, I was in college and my dad was still heating up the coffee. Let's say my mother made coffee in the morning and my dad wanted to heat up a cup in the afternoon. He was still pouring the coffee into a pot and putting it on the burner on the stove and heating up the coffee. And we were like, dad, we have a microwave now. And he was like, well, I know how to, my way is working for me. I know how to heat the coffee. Now this kind of an attitude is what you're going to find when you suggest online meetings to people. You're just going to find people saying, I know there's new technology that does this, but I just don't want to do it. The old way was working for me, and I just don't want to do it. I want to do it the old way. And so this is an attitude you want to help people to overcome as gently as you can, because the online meetings are a source of life-giving and life-saving social support. We're going to talk about that a bit later in the module. But not to make my dad sound like the only uh, bad guy in the story. I identify with this myself because if someone said to me just three months ago, Amy, you have to teach all your classes online, I would bristle at that because I teach in person. I've got that down. That's something I know. It's something I like. I'm good at it. And I don't, want, I don't want to use the new technology because the way I'm doing it works for me. And that's basically the attitude any human being would have. But we're all kind of now forced. I'll be teaching the summer 2020 an online class, and I have no choice but to jump in. But when I jump in, I may find that the water is fine, and your clients, when they make that transition to online meetings, they're going to sort of be forced to do it now 
But when they do it, they're going to find that the water is fine, that they're still able to have that wonderful social support they're used to. They'll still be able to make friends, find a sponsor, and do everything online that they used to do face-to-face. -face. I want to point out a recent story that's been published since COVID. Sugar Ray Leonard, the famous boxer, told his story on an online news outlet. He talked about coming into Alcoholics Anonymous, and he talked about when COVID started. He himself did not want to go to online meetings, just exactly what I'm describing. And in the story, he talks about how he realizes he started to not be his best self without going to meetings. And he started to go to online meetings and found them to be helpful. So as I mentioned before, your clients are going to face obstacles, nuisance obstacles, I would say, to remote meetings. I want you to know what they are in advance so that you can prepare your clients for them. Your client might find that the meeting has a password and they don't know what the password is. The Zoom address might have changed. It might say email the group leader for access or for the password and your client has done that but they haven't heard anything back. Your client might calculate the time change correctly but it might be listed incorrectly on the meeting list. Your client will need an internet connection and they might not have it. If they have only a phone, they can phone into the meetings, but the meeting lists are on, on the internet. So there's a way around that, but sort of a paradox that the resources for telephone meetings are on the internet. It, uh, joining a meeting will burn up their minutes and they might be have the, the experience of Zoom bombing. Zoom bombing you might have heard of. On the upper right-hand side is a New York Times article about it. Zoom bombing is when someone, a bad actor, who has an intention to disrupt the meeting, jumps on the meeting and they might show offensive images or they might use offensive words. Um, but there is some very good news and that is that Zoom bombing is almost entirely eradicated at this time. And that's because um, under this heading in our website, Helpful Information for Setting Up and Running Remote Meetings. Under this heading, there's a link to the New York Intergroup's Toolkit for Handling Unwanted Meeting Disruptions, and it walks a person through. These are for people who are actually running the online meetings, and there are now so many ways to protect the integrity of the meeting. And Zoom has put in privacy and security procedures immediately when the Zoom bombing started. And between these safeguards, like using a waiting room and having a co-host so the co-host can watch the meeting and immediately shut off the video of anything offensive or kick someone out of the room if there's anything offensive, and these things are working and the meeting environment is safe again. Of course, there's countless upsides to remote meetings. There's an ability to connect with this all-important, abstinence-specific social support, which helps people stay sober, essential for helping people stay sober. Of course, it's free of COVID risk. There's an abundance of remote meetings now with several at any hour of the day. It can, it's inspiring to see people from all over the country and around the world getting sober. You can attend a meeting anonymously by stopping your video. You can change the way your name appears by taking your last name off for privacy. And you can just listen. There's no need to participate verbally. You can listen in on a meeting while you're washing the dishes or folding laundry or sewing masks. There's no travel time and no cost of gas or bus fare. Another huge upside of diverse meetings. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with Alcoholics Anonymous, but one of the things, or Narcotics Anonymous, one of the things people really love is choosing a meeting that where they're going to find people who are like them. So there were women's meetings, young people's meetings, LGBTQ plus meetings. There were meetings for AA members who don't subscribe to the idea of a higher power. There were alternatives to 12-step meetings. I'll be telling you more about those. There are meetings for veterans and active duty members, and there are beginners meetings. So one way to engage your client if they're hesitant about a 12-step meeting is to invite them to go to a meeting that doubles down on their sense of identity. 
They're going to find people there who are in recovery from addiction, so they'll have that first identity uh, match with the group, and maybe also find a meeting where the people are also women or also queer or also veteran active duty. That means your client is going to identify with the people in the group along two lines of their identity, and that's very powerful. Now, I would also strongly recommend beginners meetings because these meetings are tailored and tooled toward being welcoming to the beginner and to covering beginner's topics. If your client is new to AA or NA, they should definitely enter with um, beginner's meetings. So now we're going to step back and talk a little bit about some of the research on Alcoholics Anonymous. This is like the first um, research part um, of these modules where I'm going to chime in and let you know some of the research findings. So a really important paper came out just as COVID was descending on us. This paper just came out in March 2020 and the New York Times picked up on it right away. First of all, let me tell you, this paper is a review of all of the other research on Alcoholics Anonymous and it's a very high level of review. This paper is 120 pages long and it enumerates in great detail all the procedures they took to analyze the data. What this paper does is it studies, it analyzes the consensus of 27 studies on Alcoholics Anonymous and what they find on the right hand side of the slide that New York Times nailed it. The New York Times said, Alcoholics Anonymous versus other approaches, the evidence is now in. The updated review shows it performs better than some other common treatments and is less expensive. And that's exactly what this study has shown. It shows that AA performs just as good as or better than other addiction treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy for addiction or motivational enhancement therapy. It does it better, just as good as or better, at, and if the outcome is abstinence, AA outperforms the other approaches. And also, it's cheaper. As you may know, AA is free, and people um, they, uh, collect in a face-to-face -face meeting, they pass a hat for a donation, um, where, of course, as more formal treatment has a cost. So AA works is the takeaway from this landmark study. Another important point I want to make to you about AA and the effectiveness of it, and we're going to talk about alternatives to AA um, in a few slides from now, but, but I, I appreciate I'm talking a lot about AA up front here, but it's important to differentiate this concept that is relevant no matter what their mutual aid group is. And this differentiation is the differentiation between AA attendance and AA involvement. So AA attendance is simply going to a meeting and checking a box, I attended. AA involvement means something different. AA involvement means not only are they going to the meeting, but there's, they're also involved in the meeting at a certain level of depth. It means the person celebrated an AA birthday, or they have a sponsor, or they've been a sponsor, or they identify themselves as an AA member. So AA involvement is a deeper level of involvement. And what the research shows is that AA involvement is more strongly related to abstinence or what my field calls, quote, good drinking outcomes than just attendance alone. Now, the, the takeaway from this finding is we want our clients not only to attend AA or another mutual aid group, but we want them to get involved in that group. So we want them to do take on a service commitment or share in the meeting or do something in the meeting like be the timekeeper. We want them to become more deeply involved because that's going to have a bigger payoff for their recovery. What this slide shows, the rows here on the left, percent days abstinent, that would be over the past 90 days, how many days was the person completely without alcohol? And so the higher the count, the better. And the, the row underneath that drinks per drinking day, that is, on, when, on a day when they did drink, how many drinks did they have? And, and that one, a higher score is, is worse, is a bad outcome. The top one, a high score is good. The bottom one, a high score is bad. And what you see in the numbers in the boxes are the correlations. And what it shows is that for Alcoholics Anonymous attendance, that correlates very strongly with percent days abstinent 
but notice that Alcoholics Anonymous involvement correlates even more strongly. And the correlation for the drinks per drinking day would be negative, because when one is up, the other would be down in a favorable situation. So it shows how involvement is more powerful. I found this in my own research, and I've seen, read about it in other people's research, too. Let's turn our attention to Narcotics Anonymous, and our website has a section on Narcotics Anonymous meetings. We both have a list of virtual meetings worldwide in Narcotics Anonymous. That looks like this. And what you see the first meeting on Friday afternoon is in the UK, Exeter, Devon. The next meeting listed is in, out of Lisbon. And the final meeting is in Sydney, Australia. But these are English-speaking meetings. And there's a pull-down menu that lets you choose um, the language. And this NA website has about 13 languages of meetings. And this is your NA virtual meetings based in Minnesota. And you can see these are Sunday's meetings running into Monday and Tuesday meetings, and there's a great number of Minnesota-based virtual meetings as well. So I bring this first module to a close. In this module, we have covered why this topic is important now, an introduction to our website of resources to support addiction recovery during COVID-19. We've touched on what we already know about virtual meetings, including different types of meetings, obstacles to virtual meetings, and benefits of mutual virtual meetings. We've talked about the research on Alcoholics Anonymous and whether it works. And we have also talked about the differences between AA attendance and AA involvement. Now, please click the link to hear the second module. And in the second module, we will cover these topics more on research on AA, research on this sort of magic of absence-based social support, virtual, additional 12-step resources that are virtual, alternatives to mutual aid, uh, by, beg your pardon, alternatives to 12-step groups, resources for those who are worried about someone else's drinking, research on Al-Anon, 12-step conferences, the role of doing service to recovery, recovery community organizations, what to do if your client only has a telephone that does not connect to the internet, accessing addiction treatment right now in the time of COVID, and overall recommendations. With that, I conclude the first module. I thank you so much for your kind attention to this important topic. Please reach out to me if you need me. I wish you all the best, and again, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all you do.